And so I want to first just uh, introduce um, Dr. Nadim Karkabe. Thank you for joining us and for chairing this panel. Um, just to introduce uh, Nadim to those of you who do not know him. Um, Nadim is a postdoctoral fellow, Martin Buber Society of Fellows. He is an anthropology and cultural studies lecturer at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And uh, he is also an editor editorial board member in Tohu magazine. Um, so thank you very much. And ask, of course. So um, just uh, um, just to say, just to throw a few uh, few ideas of what we've been having, and for you to perhaps relate to. Uh, so uh, uh, we touched on some central issues uh, in independent cultural production of ethnofuturism. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you to discuss or comment uh, either the different uh, social contexts that underlie expressions of Afrofuturism and Arab futurism, the diversion, preoccupation of Western science fiction with technology and alternative non-Western ethnofuturisms that aim for social, uh, sociopolitical change. Uh, the impact of contemporary uh, imperialism, neocolonialism, and uh, uh, representative democracy in its current uh, form on collective history, and of course the utopia-dystopia divide and the pos possibility for gray or perhaps a colorful uh, dwelling. I know this is way too much to say in 10 or uh, so minutes, but uh, this is just to, uh, to, to repeat some of the, sorry. Break it. Two points, yeah. uh, them, and and uh, and think about uh, political imaginations. I'll, would you like me to start with uh, my own question, or would you like to go on first? Uh, okay. Talia, would you like to start with? Because you have something concrete to, pre to, to present. Uh, you can go ahead with your questions. Yeah. If okay, you okay, okay sure. Go, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. We, we change the, the whole thing. Yeah. I, I don't mind to do it if you prefer. Uh, let's let's, let's your make it dynamic, I guess. So you could uh, sneak in your uh, I'll, I'll sneak uh, in. things uh, in between. So right, I was uh, I was thinking a lot about, uh, especially about the latter uh, uh, presentations, and uh, with uh, with what we've seen uh, with this. I mean, there is a definite uh, obsession with uh, with uh, the past and uh, and uh, um, uh, memory uh, in in this uh, country because of the unsettled uh, future that uh, is is uh, is ongoing. And, and the I unsettled past. Sorry. Is, and the unsettled past, which is. Yes. So I'm I'm asking, um, what are uh, I mean? Uh, I'd like to ask Ronaldo to relate to uh, the what's what there is in the state to to uh, Palestine and Israel. More currently, you've mentioned the uh, Ferguson and uh, perhaps uh, Nation of Islam or so on. And on the other hand, you have. Uh, 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 Zionism or uh, the symbol of Zion as a diasporic uh, um, uh, exile and return uh, thing that is reoccurring in uh, in, uh, in science fiction and in futurism, and uh, for Zabali and uh, uh, perhaps as well to Talia uh, to tell us about. Uh, what kind of responsibility uh, either Palestinians or Israelis can take from thinking about the future? Perhaps for Palestinians, uh, there is uh, some, uh, um, it's a challenge to think of co-sovereignty over such a place, well, about responsibilities to be taken. Uh, and about, so, so this is on the one hand you have hope, on the other hand you have fear of a second Nakba perhaps of these uh, again this uh, exile and uh, and uh, and displacement. So let's start with this and uh, perhaps we open it later. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So, yeah. uh, I guess I I would say uh, trying to put that all in uh, perspective. Uh, as another writer said that for the African diaspora, the apocalypse has already happened uh, in terms of 
the slave trade being the basis of capitalism, um, as a founding moment of capitalism. And there are always, I think, dystopia and utopia are going to accompany each other. And then and how this tradition relates to this region, I think of two individuals, uh, and it's tied into both the idea of a Jewish state and Palestine. Um, for example, I would say uh, the utopian aspect of it, if you talk about the first half of the 20th century or the late part of the 19th century, uh, someone like Theodore Herzl would have been a contemporary of somebody like W.E.B. Du Bois when they start uh, f um, his idea of Zionism that he forms in the Jewish diaspora and Du Bois and, and uh, others starting the first several uh, Pan-African Congresses until uh, the Africans themselves following uh, during the anti-colonial struggle then take the leadership in it. And in the second half of the 20th century, where then, following World War II, the a large number of the African diaspora begins to identify more with the Palestinian, uh, what's going on with them in terms of, well, I guess for them it would have been called, I think the word was a disaster, what happens in the middle of the 20th century, and how those things change over time in terms of the narrative of, of let me see, what, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, in relation to American foreign policy. And, uh, and the way I'm trying to say this is a lot of times these narratives and people look at the future are directly parallel with foreign policy and domestic policy. For example, American foreign policy is often a reflection of its domestic policy in terms of how they deal with people. Uh, for example, when uh, foreign policy people deal with in America deal with in international relations and take a hands-off approach or what they're called offshoring now in terms of letting things take their, um, with minimal interference, in domestic policy that's called benign neglect in terms of we're not going to have the state interfere uh, as much with what's going on in the inner city. And so these dystopian visions and utopian visions seem to run parallel depending on uh, what's the internal tension of the country at the time. And as I was talking with a friend when I was coming over here, um, two African Americans have been very important, even like, for example, I can't think of his name right now. He got a Nobel Prize uh, during the formation of the modern country of Israel in 48 when he came back. Uh, um, I can't think of his name right now. They named it. Uh, can anyone, does anyone know who I'm talking about? Somebody Google for me real quick. African American Nobel Prize winner. 1948 or 50, I think, and, and throw in Israel and then see what name pops up. It, it should pop up. Uh, oh, I mean anyone here on your phone or whatever, and then just blurt it out. Um, and so, uh, the United States, and the reason I use his name versus Du Bois's name, they both had two central uh, roles in terms of how the African diaspora should look at themselves in relation to, well, I don't read Hebrew. Um, oh, it's in English now? What's his name? Uh, Ralph Bunch. Okay, Ralph Bunch was very big in terms of uh, the formation as the Israeli state. And that's why uh, for uh, a growing number of black intellectuals, we just look at Barack Obama as like a Ralph Bunch. Okay, he's a safe black person for the international system to deal with. And he, along with Bunch, worked night and day to just have black Americans think of just America, be a good citizen, and whatever. Whereas Du Bois has a much more radical vision where at the end of his life, Du Bois, he's buried in Accra, Ghana, where Kwame Nkrumah, the president of Ghana, invites him to live at the end of his life. Because he is, uh, Du Bois is the dominant 
I, even though I know that people might argue based upon other gender politics and other, but Du Bois is clearly head and shoulders the dominant black intellectual of the 20th century in terms of his thinking, in terms of his, what he does with Afrofuturism. We uh, talk about his short uh, story, The Comet, uh, which was a take on race relations. So this idea of how, and I mentioned earlier Du Bois' ideas being a foundational element of what we would call Afrofuturism later, that to get people moving in a certain direction, you have to have a utopian type of narrative for people that will be willing to work. For instance, the civil rights movement, the utopian narrative was proclaimed by King and others, like being to the mountaintop, using the the uh, journey of the, the uh, pardon? The biblical. The biblical narrative, talking about been to the mountaintop. He knows he's not going to get there with the rest of them, later dies, OK, as a, this utopian journey. And that's why even uh, to keep focused on that narrative and that utopian is to try and rediscover America, uh, uh, Obama, when he's getting ready to run for president, tries to call us the, the Joshua generation in terms of, okay, we have our freedom now. I guess we got to go burn down some cities or something or find our American Jericho or whatever to deal with. So he wants us to keep fighting to try and reform America. And, where, and so whereas uh, the afro futurists are like, kind of done with being limited to the American project, you know? And the, and and the uh, Christian... Uh, uh, yeah, the Christian uh, aspect of it, because, you know, that's uh, of, of declining influence. And do you feel there is, in this point 2.0, new directions, well, perhaps, uh, well, to, to Africa well, or to uh, well, the, the Arab world is, or in Islam? The, in the 2.0 wave, like a lot of you riches. I'd rather be a dual citizen. I'd like to have. I'd like to have, be a citizen of the African Union and American citizen. So I have a way of getting out of the country in case something goes wrong in America. I can, <laughs> you know, I don't have to. Trings a bell to. Huh? Trings a bell to some people. You know, and so and uh, and um, for example, when I was in Africa, uh, there were there are increasing discussions of this idea of dual citizenship and terms of development and some other issues. And, um, and, and it has something to say where I think um, um, the, what, uh, in the context of globalization, uh, prior generations of various diasporas in the West, um, similar to other groups or other experiences, I remember studying the history of other ethnic groups in Europe. And to put it in a nutshell, I'm no longer interested in trying to prove I'm good enough to be around white folks. I have a PhD. I am the daughter of educated parents. I have a nice living standard. I can spell. I can spell their mother's name. I can do quality research. And I'm just no longer interested in trying to uh, help them understand their insanity in terms of the way they've constructed American society. I'm bored with that. I want to do something more interesting. And uh, that's probably where it is. I think the thing is, uh, also, uh, as one of the things Plekhanov talks about in art, art and Social Life, why should I attach my wagon to something that's clearly in decline? OK? The West, in a lot of ways, is uh, intellectually uh, worn out. They have new, new ideas uh, to speak of. And it, so it seems like, to a certain extent, that what that philo German philosopher Oswald, Oswald Spengler was talking about, the decline of the West is now coming into reality. I'm not so sure it's a decline as much as everybody else is rising. OK? And so uh, they're no longer the only game in town anymore, you know, in terms of uh, we both know People in the room, like, you don't have to work in your home country anymore. You can go other places and work and not be so much. So it's kind of a post-territorial national kind of thing. I don't necessarily believe in patriotism anymore. And I'm a fourth-generation veteran. I have absolutely nothing to prove to the U.S. anymore. My family for four generations served the country even when we were disrespected. Uh, grandfather Korean War, I'm a Cold War veteran. Father's a Vietnam veteran. I don't owe them anything. So uh, my family's paid their dues. 
And so I would say in the 21st century for here on in, and uh, thinking about the background, what do you say about when I remember you said you were Martin Buber, that was it, the, the thou and the I or the versus the I, it or relationship. Um, from here on in, our value is going to be articulated by what value comes to the relationship. Not, um, it's not going to be based upon what I can silently do for you to construct something based upon a constitution that said I was three fifths of a person. Okay, and part of that process is this continual decolonization. D um, and, the, and all these forces that are still unfolding, and it's not over yet. Some of it's going to be violent uh, before it's over. Ferguson, and what happened after Ferguson was just the beginning. And um, as America transitions from a um, the new what we call the new Jim Crow or the um, uh, mass incarceration to a mass surveillance society, and so that this is where these new visions of citizenship and how it will relate to other people are really coming forth. And the 2.0 phase of this thing is where I think the philosophical part is going to probably be solidifying over the next few years, replacing, you know, as this society, as the societies continue to decay, it's, it's a transition point where uh, we're no longer looking to King and, and a lot of people that were in the 20th century we are in a transition point, and that's what the 2.0 transition represents, uh, new ideas that are going to move us forward. And I think it's the equivalent of what was going on in Europe between, you could say, roughly 1890 to 1915, you know, for say where, you know that where Europe really doesn't become the Europe we know until about 1914, 15. And so this is kind of that same kind of... of um, uh, what two, the 2.0 wave of Afrofuturism represents. Uh, sorry, I know that might have sounded somewhat incoherent, but so I mixed some kind of. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so Tali, and Tali, I would, in the local context, uh, about uh, hopes, fears of displacement, returns, uh, what kind of uh, futurism can happen in a way? Because would you like to see? Um, so, okay, so hi, first of all, I'm Talia. Um, the Talia Yale referred to before. Uh, thank you for that, by the way. It was interesting to listen to you. Um, may, maybe just a quick background about the, what the Guyava platform is. So it's just, it's a, it is like an art platform for artistic actions that deal with the idea of opening up the Middle East. And um, I still call it the Middle East, even though I check the maps. Uh, but, and I really actually would love to talk to you about the difference between what uh, Guyava is proposing, which is uh, more of an idea of uh, the great Assyria or Sham, uh, what it used to be called, and how it's different from what you call uh, East uh, Asia, West Asia. Sham is just a little piece of Western Asia. Yeah, so, um, so it's a good way to... Yeah, yeah Sham is good. I'm in the good area yeah, then. It's okay. a cornerstone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sham is a cornerstone. Let's start with Sham and we'll reach with the okay, nation. Good. <laughs> um, so, uh, so just to tell you, so the platform consists of various uh, art uh, actions that go from film to, um, uh, I had conducted a radio station for months and uh, there was a symbolic trip to Beirut. Yeah, I have like this thing with pictures, but we, I think the, it, yeah, it's, uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> you, you can decide. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, and there was a radio station, and there was a symbolic trip to Beirut, as I did with the Zahot. Um, and there's a geo tagging website which, um, where you can uh, remark the route between Jaffa, Tel Aviv, and Beirut. And so there are different actions that go, um, and I call them actions more than artworks because uh, I maybe want to try to talk about the, well, this is the geotagging website where you can mark the road between Jaffa, Tel Aviv, and Beirut. Um, and the idea behind the platform is to use art in various ways and to, or reflect within art the various ways to, to rethink this area of, you call it Sham or the Middle East or, 
wherever we are stuck here, um, and try to think about it as a place without any Soviet authority. And when we, I was invited to here, thank you for that as well, um, I was thinking about so how, in a way, this, these works, all these uh, art actions are, um, in a way, relating to the future uh, of our present life, but they're very not futuristic, mainly because they're not containing any kind of um, technology within all the imagined situations, the, the politically imagined situation that Guyava is uh, striving to, um, where it's trying people to rethink them are uh, places where technology does not exist anywhere. So how you see, what you see in the film, there's an, it's a film series that are, are all um, just people walking in roads that they couldn't have walked on before. So taking out technology out of futurism, when I thought about this in this context of the, the conference here today, made me think about how uh, maybe and maybe what Guyava is offering is not to look at the future as a either a dystopian or utopian place because um, in a way I feel that both dystopias and utopias still deal with the same strategies of fear and hope which are exactly our, uh, what I feel that at least me as someone who is living here are stuck with when we try to think about the future as either a total disaster or this utopian dream and what I'm trying to do in Guyava in, love, uh, uh, in a lot of senses is to uh, maybe look at the area of where there's just people who are trying to get along with each other with their past that are coming to them, with their expectations of the future, but not with this either belief or fear of what is going to happen. And this is why a lot, also the films are very much uh, instructed in this very long, ongoing present moment, which does not contain uh, literally within the frame story of the, of the films um, an actual past or an actual future. Um, so I don't know. This maybe my take upon the, upon these these ideas at the at the start of it, and or maybe just <coughs> just because of that uh, a lot of the actions are, are and, and the film also the film that you saw Sham is um, is not an, in a way it's not a narrative film. So these are all characters who were invited, or characters people who were invited to take the part in this uh, act twenty four hour action. Uh, which are, they didn't know what is exactly what's going to happen, they knew, and they came as themselves. So Samira, that's the one who you pointed out, who did not enter the truck eventually, uh, but uh, she stayed along to look what's going on. But uh, she, but they were all asked to come as who they are at this present moment and just try to, in a way, physically even figure out how they can relate to each other at a certain point of time. Um, um, I don't know when to start or, or to what point to relate first, but um, um, maybe, like, I think I wanted to, to, maybe to relate to the thing about thinking the past or what past is present with us at the moment. Um, uh, <coughs> like, I think... Um, it's it's uh, in a way it's very interesting to think about the past as a duration, in a way, because things that uh, we know if we know about things from the past, then they are with us now here, uh, and I don't think like maybe you know I don't think people here are interested in the past enough or in a, in a way and i think we differ by what kind of past do we want to keep with us like in what duration are we what 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 uh, yeah in, in what what like what's with us in the room and what kind of past um is is uh, is is very different and even regarding like uh, a political like i would like to call like I used to call uh, these kind of projects or uh, the projects uh, uh, presented by Ael, I used to call it like a, a political imagination uh, art. Because it's really like, and I used to, uh, I used to believe in it more, let's say even. Like, and I, 
Uh, I used to believe in its uh, uh, relevance to the public space and its uh, uh, to its relevance to creating new imaginations uh, and with the relation between human conditions and public spaces and ways to imagine the future. Uh, but I think this idea of uh, that we have different pasts and the idea of uh, uh, d like how much do we want to fix this place, you know? Like I don't think we are all like uh, interested in fixing this place. <laughs> I'm not interested anymore in fixing this place as much as I was like for example six years ago. Uh, and I think this, uh, uh, like you need to have some kind of an affiliation to fixing the place or even seeing it as, uh, you know, seeing yourself on the ship anyhow in order to, uh, you know, maybe it's just an illusion and you're not on the ship anyhow. Uh, and people are seeing you on the ship, they're saying, come help fix, but you know, you're standing on the shore and there's a sea between you and the ship. And it's just an illusion that you are on the ship anyhow. So it's, uh, uh, and in this meaning, I think that's why we, we're still thinking like, like I think, uh, like to, to put another comment and then maybe m uh, try to relate the two. Uh, like, I think it's easier to think about, like, I, I think the futuristic art that we get from uh, the USA, for example, has a certain, uh, has a certain notions of people living in a big metropolitan as individuals, but not rethinking really all the infrastructure again, you know? Like it's, uh, how, how did you say before? Like future is here, but it's not well, it's, it's not un, equally un, divided. Yes, yeah, unevenly distributed. Yeah. And using your ship analogy, they always say in America, oh, we came in different boats, but we're all on the same ship now. Yeah, but black and brown people, we're the people on the Titanic in the steerage section as the ship's going yeah. down who can't get up to the upper deck fast enough. While the wealthy that when this all crashes in, they got their little boats to either go into space and be in Elysium or be in gated communities. Yeah. And so that's why, as you're saying, there's no, there, they did a, 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 a survey. There's a decline in patriotism and people under 40, even young or white people are losing interest. They realize that everything that they're taught in school is being invested in whiteness. Is, white people are now outpacing everybody else in terms of a lot of health disparities now, in terms of whether it's use of opioids, it's like it seems like the whole country is getting ready to like we're all going to become drug abusers now to deal with this craziness. So, yeah, just concurrence. Sorry for interrupting. So. Yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, yeah. But 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 I think it's a certain world, you know, like to live because then you're you're in a. Uh, like it certainly differs. Uh, you know, there's. Um, even if you look at the cartoon networks and you see how much, like, uh, you know, uh, tunnels, underground, uh, it, it seems like for when I see the cartoon networks here, it looks uh, uh, too fast, uh, 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 not coherent. Uh, but I guess for a kid now, uh, you know, just watching the TV in New York, just uh, it it looks very normal like he gets in the underground each day so like i i it, it's um, like it's total different world in a way that's why i think and and uh, in that sense i feel that western futuristic art is like that's why i think it it deals more with like with lots of technology because uh, the human condition are taken for granted in a way like it's taken, either it will go this way, either it will go this way. But there's, as you said, there is no really building of a really new, a, a new brave world, in a way. Uh, you were saying that uh, you are uh, uh, against uh, secularism, but I, I feel from you that you are actually uh, dwelling somewhere in this bleak uh, 
uh, terrain of uh, losing uh, belief and faith and hope in a certain future, as if, you know, just abandoning the ship. <laughs> and, uh, and what I want to ask now about actually uh, uh, the, the, uh, the role of religion in this, in addition to perhaps also cynicism and other feelings that might have been coming up from the local context, is the religion. Because as, as it occurs to me, this um, uh, movement or this form of thought of the future came very much against a certain uh, form of... Uh, of religious uh, belief, of apocalyptic uh, uh, visions, into something that uh, man, man, man-made future can achieve, you know, by by collective uh, effort, and uh, and uh, perhaps to some extent this uh, this was a, 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 a broken root at some point, I'm, and maybe today. There is uh, new combinations of, uh, you know, both uh, technological science and, uh, you know, positivist uh, thinking of uh, of, uh, of facts made by man, along with uh, certain uh, uh, nuanced uh, interpretation of uh, of religious uh, futures. So I, I open it again for you. Uh, no, when you mention religion and and being bleak or whatever, no, I still have joy and I still have hope. But I understand through the transition, I just wonder, am I going to be able to take the pain that is getting ready to happen? Because one of the things uh, I've seen enough to know, no, I still believe in God. Um, and I think that, um, or, or whether you want to call it supernatural inspiration, uh, it, it, it's still possible. But... Um, and I'm not a fundamentalist or something like that, but I do know in a lot of religious traditions, uh, people learn, can you accept whatever God's will is? Because a lot of people, you know, the way they interpret it, you know, I think, uh, no, because uh, we were talking about this past Saturday at our um, Black Speculative Art Movement thing in the Bronx. Um, the idea in the midst of all this stuff and still having joy you know, in terms of still being able to have joy and have those moments of joy that help you get to the next day and then the next day and the next day until you kind of figure it out, okay? Uh, because, and that's where I wouldn't just say it'd be all secular because sometimes an artist also has to have inspiration. You know, it's not something that necessarily can be secularly always mapped out. Sometimes it, uh, inspiration, wherever it comes from, whether it's, you know, God, Jehovah, Allah, Lord, honey, Ra, whoever that is to you, Buddha, uh, that insight a lot of times will help people connect those dots to then come up with something that might be unique, but it won't resemble so much as you previously understood it. Um, and so that, yeah, so I wouldn't say it's so much bleak, it's just the thing is, and I want to qualify my earlier statement, Religion in the modern world has been too much used to be a, be patriotic to the state. If we know a lot of our beliefs and values, or other, let me let me let me, uh, I'm just gonna start talking to y'all like if you we were back in the states uh, or how we talk to each other. If you all were African Americans, we would say something like, "Look, we were here before there was a United States. We will be here after there's a United States, and it no longer exists." And then it takes on say. Uh, the old-fashioned biblical narrative, for instance, in two more years, it will have been 400 years since the first African slave set in the United States. Now, there was another population that was someplace trapped for 400 years, and after 400 years, the magicians could no longer fool them, so CNN and MSNBC, they no longer believed them anymore, and they found the leadership and the will to leave that condition and do something else. And so... Yeah, in real time right now, I'm waiting to see what kind of magicians is Pharaoh going to put in front of us the next two years to say how wonderful it is to be black in America and why you should still stay sit up under Pharaoh for another couple hundred years in terms of what are the magicians going to do. And I don't know how they're going to do it, but uh, that's why the artists are, and at least in our movement, we are there to mock Pharaoh when they try and come up, they'll probably have all kind of pictures with Obama and his family again in two years. 
in commercials. He's going to probably be sent traveling around the country getting us to buy in again. Okay? So that's where, yeah, that, 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 that you're going to see, I think, a radical prophetic tradition again take root that is not tied up with televangelists and all these other preachers and fake religious figures. Uh, uh, there are some inspirational people that are religious doing some great work that uh, are struggling uh, without support from the mainstream, doing a lot of great work, who read my stuff also. And so that's why I said at the grassroots level, there is a new perspective. It has Christians, Muslims, at least in, 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 in the African-American context around this second wave, traditional African religion. And that's what I liked. Um, I can't remember my Spanish friend's name, what she was pointing out. So you're seeing preachers and Muslims that are reading science fiction books and then reading Cory Doctorow and blending in all this stuff and putting it in a sermon, you know, in terms of trying to explain what is happening in the context of a neo-Pentecostal black liberation theology. <laughs> now that's the new stuff that is at a very small, that is taking root now. Uh, the guy in my book, you would have read, where's the language? Andrew Rollins. He's chapter eight or nine in my book that you reviewed, uh, you know, and he, uh, he, he was a former member of the Black Panther Party, which meant he was a materialist, a revolutionary nationalist, who's now been an African Methodist preacher for the last 30 years. So that transition is happening. So it's not, I didn't come, mean to come across as bleak. You know, I, let me put my mask back on so I can go home and still have a job when I get back to the States, because there were some people afraid for me even coming here or whatever. They're like, you know, they, I told them I'd be fine or whatever, but no. Everything is not necessarily bleak. It's just that, can, uh, just sorry to sound redundant, we're just going to, can we take the pain that's on its way? Because our leaders are not telling the people that the pain is on its way right now. And can we take the pain as an Octavia Butler describes in Wildsea and come out on the other side transformed? That's what I have questions about now. And that has to deal with my belief in the human beings because, I mean, um, we have examples of people being sent to camps and all this other stuff. So, man, I just I don't know. My faith in people is kind of like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, even now it's happening where, where people, I mean, we're turning away immigrants, everything else. So, uh, I don't know. I just have a lot of questions, and it's more than bleakness. And sometimes I'm, uh, you know, I just have a lot of doubts. Uh, even after I write all this stuff now, I just have a lot of serious doubts in our capacity to adapt to some of the painful realities coming. It was strong words, Emerson. You, you remind me a bit about uh, the kind of uh, discourse we have here uh, among uh, Palestinians in, in, uh, in relation to uh, time and space. Yeah. We've been here, we'll pass through, and so this kind of, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, referring to that thought about uh, that uh, we, we've been here before and we'll be here afterwards, um, which is again an assumption that, again, that uh, I, I'm trying to practice in, in Guyava, that people are going to be here after Israel before. After Palestine, before Palestine. After and saying that, I just remember that actually you could say the same. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I said the apocalypse for us has already happened. You know, already right. the worst that can be done has been done. So we'll survive whatever's going to happen. We might not like it, but you know, and we'll just adapt to it. And it's going to look something like out of an Octavia Butler story. You know, you know. Uh, right now, I guess our competing visions of America are Octavia Butler versus Heinlein, storm ship troopers. You know, in terms of authoritarianism at the moment. So, you know, so, um, yeah, that's uh, why so many people are using sci-fi. And I don't know what they're doing in Israel, but in America, political leadership now are actually having meetings around that. On the conservative side, they study Isaac Asimov and Foundation Series to understand decline and rise again, the Foundation Empire and so forth. And... The left, they're reading Butler, Margaret Atwater's The Handmaiden's Tale, and all this other stuff to try and figure out what's going to happen. And I think in, 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 
on a parallel thing that explains also, you know, the uh, religious fundamentalism and, and stuff. And and that's why I think, like, I, when, I, when I meant the ship, I meant the Israeli ship, I think. You know, not the... Uh, uh, but but that's why I think th there is a need for new heroes, you know? Like, that's why I think there's a need for... Uh, 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 for a really dig in in uh, in, in in what in, in in some other perspective, like I don't think you know like that, uh, um, like I don't care uh, like I care more for a larger vision in uh, in, in in a way, um, and uh, of course all of what I said is you know. Uh, critique on Western secularity, but of course I still, uh, uh, you know, want to practice that, and of course I see myself still as uh, 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 having some le le leftist vision in many ways, but uh, um, like I just don't think a uh, futuristic art should be uh, uh, how can I say it like I don't think sh it should be a, a, fun a functional a very near future functional thing only you know and it should only use the terms of uh, you know being a polite democrat and saying oh wow I love you all we were gonna have a great future together no, we might not have a great future together. Like uh, you know, this is uh, uh, that's that that's w w what I meant. That I don't need this. Uh, like as a in my political life, I might care more more for it, you know. But I feel weird when it comes to creating visions in art. You know, all of this uh, uh, feeling. Like I can, I can understand it as a political need, but you know, but it's, it's. Uh, but I feel that putting it in the art field is actually cascading it in a way. You know, like uh, it's, it's, it's taking much power from it just by putting it in art festivals. Like I, I want the political vision in the street, and the art festival free from political visions in a way. Yeah. It's like, uh, um, doesn't mean that I don't like political art, but I mean like, you know, I want, because all the restrictions is, uh, and even when, when you look how people imagine here, yeah? All the imaginations happen, uh, like let's see one Israeli art project about living in an Islamic state, okay? Yeah, let's try imagine that. <laughs> like, why the hell? What are you afraid of? Do you think Westernism will be always here? Like, what? What kind of visions? Anyhow, being you know, it's like we are creating. It's all the time restricted in a very uh, <clears throat> like fear is there, you know. And I'm not saying. Uh, and, and and we we talk about pasts that lots of people in the area don't have them. You know, because lots of people around us just think about past differently. Lots of people around us don't think that uh, uh, the modern time started, you know, in the decline of the Ottoman Empire, then came the British, then was the colonial era, uh, and then uh, 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 the Nakba happened, and uh, uh, the colon... Like, all of this discourse is, um, like, some some of the people think about history, time, space in a different manner. And you know, like, um, that you don't need, like, you know, and this place is crazy anyhow in this thing. So I think sometimes, like, what I meant is that sometimes, uh, uh, instead of being visionary, we're actually restricting the boundaries of what's allowed to imagine, what, what, what's allowed to be imagined, in a way. Now, regarding the Arab world, I think, you know, I think uh, there's a whole, like, 
there's a real lack of new heroes. Like that's what I meant. Like I think in regarding the Arab world, I think there's a huge opportunities to do a really good uh, Arab futurism. And I think it's uh, it's not by chance that it's uh, uh, like you'll see much less political imagination works in the Arab world, and you'll see attempts to deal with futurism, with the feeling of uh, uh, dissonance, uh, estrangement, uh, uh, which I th which I think more free thing than all the time imagining finding the solution for the political situation, you know, because like I think. The estrangement, uh, the dissonance, the uh, imagining the future in a much bigger picture instead of uh, finding the solution for the uh, yeah for the political problem we're stuck in yeah in a democratic way yeah because this is always like we we always find solution in a democratic way I think that's that's needed in a way like that's missing for me. In a, in a way, that's that's what I, I was trying to say. I think you have a new project coming out. I'm trying my best. I'm digging into Islamism in ways you don't believe. Okay. <laughs> Talib, you know? would you like to uh, <laughs> add? <laughs> okay. Man, I like what you were talking about. I talked to a friend of mine who's a. Uh, uh, really into this theoretical stuff, and then she asked me, "Well, how do you figure out, plan out this revolution or whatever?" And and just in two terms of who you are, and I told, and so I told her, I said, "Tell this story," and this is in terms of uh, a graphic illustration. Uh, Doctor Anderson, based upon his military experiences, becomes a general, a bloodthirsty general in pursuit of victory, and is an authoritarian. And then I told her, I said, and after the revolution, the woman, it will be in your best interest to take me out behind the shed and have me executed because I wouldn't necessarily know how to stop. You know, because one of the things in the study of revolution, a lot of times the revolutionaries become some of the worst people yeah. on the way to freedom. So that's what I'm saying. It doesn't work out, like you say, always democratically. You know, uh, in terms of how the change looks, some of the people who were at the forefront of leadership are some of the people you need to get rid of once you've achieved your objective. You know, we don't like thinking about that uh, in terms of that, you know, because a lot of times it's our human, oh, that's our leader, and then they turn out to be fascist dictators, you know, the person who was the great leader during the change, and then, you, you know, and we don't have the will. Uh, one of the things, when I did my dissertation on the, the Black Panther Party, and I wrote this, and I think I had a people ask me, I said, really, for the Black Panther Party, it would have been better if they had executed Huey Newton at a certain stage of their development because he ended up hurting the party in the end. Uh, and really, the better vision would belong to somebody like a George Jackson at the end, towards the end, uh, when the before the party declined. But because they had this utopian romantic impulse about Huey, they couldn't bring themselves to execute him. And so they let him run the whole thing all the way down and to the ground. And that's, you know, so that's why, uh, yeah, just kind of second what you said, there's going to probably be some authoritarian mixed in with some of this. Dem everything's not going to be democratic during the change. Some of it's going to look real harshly authoritarian because you don't have time to politically educate everybody to have a political education shop. The most annoying thing about the whole Ferguson movement, remember when all these people out of town come, they go in these churches and they get in these little talking circles, you know, to talk about, huh? In the Wall Street thing. Oh yeah. my God, it was so ridiculous in terms of how it looks sometimes. So, um, yeah, the social change is sloppy. I mean, it's not neat, it's not, there's no neat dialectic to reason your way through it. I would like to ask the Audience, whether you'd like to have a question, anyone? Yeah? No? No? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, we'll take two. It's better if you look up in the. Hi, thank you. It was really interesting, all lectures. Um, I was wondering, maybe you can refer to um, um, a notion that went through all your talks today, which which uh, 
deals with history, and I think all three of you, even talking about the past and the future, mostly referred to history as a linear um, way. And except what you just said at the moment, Muhammad, which I think was a little different, the duration, and also maybe looking a little, that there are maybe other parallel ways of thinking. And I was thinking we were talking about sci-fi, and none of you mentioned uh, that history might repeat itself, that um, time tunnels might, might be made and we can go back, that there might be loops in time. And that's one thing that I think would be interesting since you are talking about futurism and none of you have a, almost haven't approached that. And on the other hand, another topic that I was thinking about, especially about Afrofuturism, is if we're talking about sci-fi, we're also talking about breaking the boundaries of body and breaking the boundaries of maybe who has a certain skin tone or uh, the flesh tone, which might also change very much in, in the future. And all those divisions of what kind of tone skin do I have and what kind of, of visuality I, I have will also change. So these are two issues that interest me, and you haven't talked about that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll take another one and then, we and then respond. Yeah. Um, can I add something to that, actually? <laughs> Which, because it reminds me of uh, what Arate was talking about. So in a way, like, it's also maybe an attempt to break the, not gender binary this time, but the political binary, and to kind of um, get political imagination or futurism or utopia or whatever to transcend the political limitations, in a way, um, that we seem to be unable to think without. So, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to make a, I mean, the whole Wall Street thing, just like a very, very quick kind of subtlety of it is that one of the reasons why I didn't go to Farosa was because of undercover action by, yes. by yeah. the police. Mm -hmm. So just that, like it wasn't, it didn't fail because of itself only, or it of didn't course, just fade away because of it. It also had like constant insidious, yes. uh, including... Uh, releasing uh, sexual predators around the camp by the police. So that's one of the reasons why mm -hmm. it didn't succeed as much as like, it could have. Just that. <laughs> okay. One last? No? Okay. Um, yeah, I've talked about... Uh, there's a book that this, uh, writer George Schuyler wrote back in the early 20th century called Black No More. Mm -hmm. And he talks about where... Uh, one of these scientists invents a machine and all the black people in America can go through the machine and become white and it messes up the psychology of the population because they don't know how to see themselves anymore because whiteness in America was always judged as, okay, what I am not, okay? And so, uh, no, I mean, there are people uh, and writers that deal with that. One of the things I can say on a practical level, this is where the practical critique comes in, People treat me where I travel around the world based upon the population there. I remember when I'm in Europe, they look at as I'm, uh, ask me if I'm from, uh, I had to lurk up this word called Maghreb uh, when I was in Paris, you know, and I'm like, oh, they think I'm from Northern Africa or whatever. And then, uh, of course, in Southern Africa, being a part of the colored population, or when I went to Cuba, they thought I was from Puerto Rico. And, you know, so uh, right now I would say the main thing is, um, there are novels that deal with what you're talking about in terms of how they take difference to another level. And when you're talking about the body, um, I'm trying to think who deals with that the best uh, that I'm aware of at the moment. Uh, it's easier to talk about Butler. Um, I think some of the, uh, uh, I, I think my favorite person now that deals with a combination of all the three things you're talking about related to body, gender, difference and post is probably Nettie Akor for at the moment in her writing um, whether it's the book Lagoon or Who Fears Death and um, so uh, more and more just in the last 36 months you're seeing a lot of this come out uh, there is a wave of young uh, writers and, and, and people working their way through the educational system writing about all this stuff. And we're just waiting for more great film directors to bring this kind of stuff to life on the screen. Because I think Nettie Okorfor just got a movie deal for her book, Lagoon. And uh, I don't know if, if they would show that movie in Israel. What was the movie, Get Out? Have you all heard of this movie? Have any of you seen it? 
it's a movie. It's called Get Out, which is kind of like uh, it's a combination horror, it's a little bit of sci-fi, and culture and politics. Where it's kind of like they took the daily life or whatever and cast it in those terms. And and we talk about so a lot of my friends talk about you know the graduate school experience being like sent to the sunken place, <laughs> you know, in terms of having to study a lot of stuff that they uh, talk about. So yeah, it's uh, it's um, all the stuff that you've pointed out now is really coming on swiftly now, and I think is going to work and filter itself out over the next four or five years. Maybe a good example of uh, thanks. A good example of uh, the. Uh, f flex like elasticity of time would be uh, Rashida Phillips's novel oh, Quantum uh, or her telescoping effect or you're talking about her quantum the, f the previous quantum one uh, no what was it called uh, anyway her first novel came out a few years ago okay can I look for it <laughs> Oh, and another one when you're talking about even body type, right? Okay, I haven't been able to read that one. Uh, there is a, um, if you pull up now, Labo am I mispronouncing? Labor Kenya. Huh? That is a, pro a Puerto Rican woman superhero that was created recently, and a lot of it was created. I don't, uh, you, know to, you know how to spell Labor Kenya? Um, okay. Okay, Labor Kenya, Labor Kenya. And she La put her in. Ah, Labor Kenya. Yeah, Labor Kenya. And that image should pop up. It has emerged as a unifying figure in the Puerto Rican community because that country's debt crisis. There she is. Because we had our speaker. She has become like the hero for the Puerto Rican community. All right. In terms of how it's really caught fire here in the last six months. And, it's and uh, the creator of La Puerta Kenya was talking at our Bronx event here recently about the idea as... as, as uh, the gentleman here pointed out the need for new heroes and new concepts to pull us forward. And because that's Puerto Rico's in a massive debt crisis right now, and, and, and she's becoming for a lot of the young Puerto Ricans a rallying cry. And that's the power of an artist, you know, in terms of uh, taking a, a, a situation, creating something, and, 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 and attracting people. Um, uh, and, 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 the, and the Afro Latino community is dealing with this idea of taking pride in their black heritage also in terms of being Afro-Latino. And so they uh, deal with the figure of La Borda Kenya as a superhero or a heroine uh, in response to this uh, crisis that's going on in the island right now, whether it's Zika and all these other kind of things. Uh, I want to maybe relate to what you were saying, just considering the... Um, um, and also maybe to what you were saying, that you don't want to see any more are dealing with, with what's going on now, and I uh, are in a way looking for more. And I feel that, again, I'm not a real fan of sci-fi, and I never mm -hmm. was, uh, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I do feel from the little I know that a lot of what any kind of art, even a futuristic art, it does is deal with the present, so it's always a reflection yeah. of what is going on in the present. Yeah. So in that kind of, uh, if you think about it like that, uh, and is that we are trying, uh, yeah. also when you, um, uh, if you're trying to look deeper into what's going on in, at the present, you will always consider the past differently and the future differently. So I don't think you can escape but to just to act out and try to realize more what is going on now and here. And not. Uh, and for me, at, at least, um, I didn't grow up on sci-fi and I never had any kind of <laughs> heroes in the sci-fi. But I think even the term of hero might be something that you, uh, I would reconsider because it's always pointing out someone as who has an answer and, and the other states of trying to um, um, understand better the question of what we're dealing with here and now. No, I, uh, like in, in another world, I will say, you know, it's uh, um, like it's, it's uh, is, Israelis, uh, Israeli artist obligation is to deal with the here and now of, of the Israeli situation in a way. You know, it's a... Um, um, it's a responsibility of its yeah. own, in its own uh, it, term. Yeah, in its own term. Like, I don't, I, it's not, I, I was talking about my own feeling, you know? It's no, no, about no, a personal... No, uh, I, I didn't take it personally, don't worry. No, no, no. but like, I mean, um, 
uh, and I I still like uh, uh, there were uh, like I bet if Alessandro and Sandy will be here next year I probably will work with them again if they ask you know it's not uh, uh, but uh, I mean like I think there's a need for something to, that will enter t um, like for example I will give you another uh, another example okay like there was, for example, in the last uh, Colombia, there was a work by uh, Nida Sonokrot, which featured an uh, uh, empty book that's in a, uh, you know, a room, you enter, you can't approach the book, but you see all the instruments that are recording the moving of the, uh, the pages, it's empty pages, and it's screened all the time in the world. And you only hear the sound uh, of the moving pages, uh, the, you know, moving. And you see imp just a great reddish picture screened. You, you know, you see the movement, but you see it screened such a, in a great image on the wall. Uh, and I think, for example, that's a great work that deals with, you know, the empty text, the empty book, or uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, in a, the Quran in a way, or the Bible in a way, or uh, uh, how it flickers all around, you know, just in machines, and uh, I don't mean it to be futuristic, I just mean like regarding what it deals with uh, um, like I just don't, I don't think it should deal with, like this This work deals more with the situation uh, in, in many ways than, um, and it doesn't have to be in a political, in, 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 in a... Um, uh, direct. In a direct, or a liberal democratic uh, vision in a way, you know mm. what I mean? Like that work is more relevant for the Palestinian society than in a way, or it's new, or it has something daring in a way that... Uh, I'm getting signals that we should uh, be concluding this. So thank you very much, everyone. It was... Uh, <laughs>